I'm delighted to um, introduce this uh, very interesting panel. We have with us digitally Arancha Gonzalez, who is a part-time professor affiliated with the School of Transnational Governance and also a former minister of foreign affairs and EU and, and EU and cooperation uh, from 2021, uh, 20 to 2021 in the Spanish government. So welcome. It's great pleasure to have you. We also have Matteo Bonomi, who is a senior fellow in EU politics and institutions at the Institute of International Affairs in Italy. So he's not far from here. And then we also have Frank Schimmelfennig, who you all know, who was a co-coordinator of the INDIV EU project and also is running an extremely interesting ERC project on borders and has published extensively on, on the issue. So we have an eminent panel dealing with enlargement and external relations. Let me say a few things on, on enlargement. I, I think there are two accounts on this. So the standard account of this is an increase in EU membership, EU places conditions, there are package negotiations going on, and candidates must comply with these requirements in order to become members. So the bonus from the conditions that are placed is membership. So it looks like pretty much a one-way process. Um, it can on one hand be seen as a necessary modernization and democratization because the type of criteria. It can also be seen as a form of voluntary self-submission under some form of imposition. And uh, new members must uh, incorporate the entire key. And of course, later entrants must therefore incorporate more insofar as the EU integrates more. So I think that's sort of the more mainstream notion of, of enlargement. I wrote in 20 or five with colleagues what I was hoping could be a basis of a second account, um, namely that I thought the notion of enlargement is too innocent. We are really talking about reconstitution of the European Union because the European Union has a constitution. It's a material constitution, not a formal democratic constitution, but it's a material constitution. So therefore the entrance, the in incorporation of a new member means that the European Union is reconstituted. And this, of course, means that the European Union's composition changes, its borders changes, its external vulnerabilities changes, it imports more diver diversity, hence the question of, of differentiation that we have been concerned with. So you're importing this and you're also getting a different type of exposure to uh, external relations because your external borders are changed. And therefore, also, the question of deepening versus widening comes in on the European Union, and this, of course, gains um, salience insofar as the EU enlarges. So there is, it's not a one-way thing, it's a much more complicated uh, situation, and it has to do with the EU's own digestive ability and the kind of cap capabilities that are being conferred on the European Union in terms of resources and so forth. Um, this is in no way to denigrate the importance of, of the new members and, and their contributions to the European Union, but of course there are significant differences in, in Europe. And I'm, see, these are some of the differences that we will be, be touching on. So I'm picking up on Alexander Stubb and referring to the fact that the current situation is also a, a situation where the European Union is confronting states that, are, that have different trajectories, different historical experiences, and also different standards of living. So we, um, we, had, I have, we had formulated four sets of questions. The um, first question is really to tap into the sentiments in the member states. So, and they are sort of zooming in, they're starting out sort of broadly and then trying to zoom in more specifically on, on the issues. So the first question that I would like to uh, pose to the participants is about sentiments, political sentiments in the member states. How likely is the EU to admit new states as full EU members? Because there was early at least talk of enlargement fatigue and some members also were expressing critical comments about this at least some years ago. Has the war in Ukraine affected that? So just confine it to 
sentiments among leaders and so on, because we'll get into the more specifics of, of the Ukraine situation in the next question. So a quick round. Would you like to start, Arancha? Thank you very much, uh, John, and thanks to, um, um, to the organizers for this very timely discussion. I think this is one of these um, existential discussions that uh, Europe uh, needs to have, and it's not an easy one. And it's not an easy one because uh, we have an accumulation of uh, different sensitivities uh, in the individual EU member states, um, different feelings uh, and sentiments towards uh, expanding the EU to new members. Uh, we had also uh, the obvious uh, difficulty that was there about how does, and, and you put it very nicely, how does the EU uh, in its institutions, uh, its procedures, uh, its decision-making digest an expansion uh, of the EU member states? And let's face it, there are also difficulties uh, 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 that are bigger uh, and smaller, depending on the exceeding country, but there are also challenges uh, that they were facing. Now, all of this uh, collided massively uh, with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and now we have um, a much more geopolitical uh, uh, view uh, on enlarging the EU that was not there before. And uh, it's been a bit of a wake up call uh, to move from treating this issue from a more bureaucratic uh, point of view to having to deal with it uh, from a much more political point of view. Um, and this wake up call can be summed up uh, basically in uh, being uh, having a much sharper understanding of what it would mean to leave uh, EU neighbors out there in the cold and what this would mean uh, for the EU member states uh, to have a neighborhood uh, that is basically uh, a new uh, a space uh, for geopolitical competition uh, with Russia, but also with others, uh, not just Russia, with others like uh, China, with others like countries in the Gulf, uh, essentially having instability in the EU borders. And this has led uh, to a much more uh, political uh, uh, debate uh, about enlargement. And if I can sum this up, uh, this uh, 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 debate that we have seen very clearly expressed uh, uh, in, in the voice of uh, German Chancellor Scholz or that you've heard uh, also with the voice uh, from Paris, from President Macron and many others in Europe. Uh, it's asked uh, al along uh, three ingredients. Ingredient number one is uh, probably the need to review the manner in which uh, accession to the EU uh, is managed. Right now, it's a, it's a, essentially an all or nothing. Uh, you have to comply with each and every requirement before you can really be a member of the family. And a discussion is uh, clearly uh, on the table now about whether or not it should be more. Uh, you are in uh, partially uh, step by step as soon as you progress in uh, uh, basically meeting uh, the requirements depending on the area. So that's ax number one. Ax number two, obviously, is accompanying uh, this discussion on the acceding member side with a discussion about rules, procedures, and decision-making within the European Union uh, itself, uh, because obviously there are concerns about uh, sustainability of decision-making uh, that is not uh, because of different voices that will come out, uh, that will come into the EU, not just that, but it's the sustainability of how do you decide uh, with many more uh, parties uh, uh, around the table um, and uh, how do you manage institutions with more actors. So it's a question of numbers as well as diversity of views. And the third axe, and I think this is uh, also a very interesting axe, is not just uh, discuss and put the entire weight on a debate about what happens in the EU, but also expand this uh, to a discussion about how do we present Europe, not just the EU, 
Europe in a much more geopolitical uh, manner? How does EU become, uh, how does Europe become a geopolitical actor? Uh, and this uh, essentially uh, is the thrust of the European political community expanding beyond the EU and uh, candidate uh, countries to um, other European uh, nations like uh, the UK, like Switzerland, like, like Norway, or like Turkey. So John, uh, just uh, this uh, very few comments to uh, respond uh, to uh, your question, uh, certainly a big wake up call, uh, and certainly a much more geopolitical debate also uh, about accession. Thank you, John Eric. Uh, to answer your question, I believe uh, we should first of all point at uh, common misperception around uh, uh, EU enlargement and EU enlargement fatigue in particular. There is, I think, a widespread misperception that associates the continuous stalemate and halt within the EU enlargement process with an effective suspension of EU integration of candidate states. I don't think this is fully the case. And on the contrary, we could see how in this, during this year already, integration has uh, somehow continued. If we look at the Western Balkan, for instance, uh, they are much more integrated with the EU today than they were 10 years ago, despite uh, Juncker uh, moratoria that we heard about yesterday. And uh, this applies to all sectors of their economy, from goods to service, to capital, to people, but goes far beyond the market integration. If we look, uh, it's true for many other policy fields. We can go look at security, police cooperation, integration on in EU agency, but also uh, uh, areas that are not traditionally related with EU integration as uh, coordination of their fiscal policy and public spending in infrastructure and so on. So in other terms, and I think this is very relevant also for Ukraine, what we have existed during recent year that is upon the formal uh, enlargement policy framework, policy coordination have become the rule and not the exception. And uh, to deal and uh, to drive integration in time of fatigue and crisis. So a bank against this backdrop, uh, backdrop, uh, backdrop uh, the world in, of, uh, in Ukraine, and especially the offer to candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova, uh, brought uh, a new impetus to enlargement policy, and it has uh, somehow pushed it back on its formal track of enlargement as a formal process of accession into you as a member. And this is certainly welcome. However, I think the question is here how to make this process that will be long-term, sustainable and effective. So how to learn from uh, the shortcoming that we have seen during this year in the Western Balkans uh, and to have a process that is capable to keep the momentum and cohesion among the member states to push for the enlargement and to make it not going off track as it is now proceeding. So not suspended, just with the alternative patterns as we see today. Thank you, John Eric. Um, so you asked about the sentiment and um, I think it's uh, important and interesting to see that uh, there is a true wave of solidarity among Europeans with Ukraine and this has uh, uh, not been decreasing, but rather growing over, over time. And I also see the decision of the uh, European Union to grant Ukraine the status of a candidate country, mainly as a symbolic sign of this solidarity. It's, Im it's important. I think it's an important assertion of community uh, and the bonds of community um, uh, within like-minded uh, European countries. But at the moment, it is not more than that. I think um, there is still no enthusiasm about enlargement as, as such. I think there is uh, still a deep running dissensus among many of the member states as to the desirability and the terms of enlargement, and this has not go gone away. I think the decision to offer uh, the association trio an, a membership 
perspective in the in the short run is is a, a gesture of solidarity of community that has um, that has been facilitated by the fact that it doesn't have any short term implications so far and uh, what I would expect to see is that, uh, say, the enlargement fatigue and uh, also the, um, the census, the diverging interests on enlargement that we have in the European Union will come back at the moment when the uh, EU has to, has to do something on its membership promise. But this will be, um, this will be off for a couple of years and um, uh, during that phase, I think uh, it will it will work as this uh, gesture of solidarity. Second question, which is really more operational in terms of what happens more on the ground. And the question is, the EU has recently granted Ukraine candidate status. Has the war made such a process less irreversible? What is the most likely future EU affiliation status for Ukraine? And what are the geostrategic implications of a looser affiliation versus full membership for Ukraine? So this is quite a mouthful of aspect, but, but I think this is a key question that we should be dealing with in, in this panel. Um, and um, should we just start in the same order? Arancha, please. Well, if there's one thing we have learned uh, from uh, previous um, enlargements of the EU and, and former you know, prior promises we've been uh, given countries, uh, take the case of Turkey, uh, is that it is very costly to give empty promises. So I hope, I don't, I don't know, uh, but I, what will, what will happen, but I hope uh, that when we took that step, and it's a step that we took in a differentiated manner for uh, Ukraine and Moldova than we did for Georgia. Let's not forget that too. So uh, we were not making blanket promises. Uh, we made uh, promises that I hope we will remember um, carry a cost uh, if they are simply empty. So uh, I think my sense is that at the political level, um, the um, decision that was taken was not an empty promise. And I think that countries, when they made uh, that decision, realized that they were taking a, a, a step in uh, getting Ukraine closer to the European Union. Now, it's true that, and that's the half, the glass half full, it's true that uh, there is a little bit of a glass half empty uh, uh, in order not to uh, sound uh, too uh, optimistic, uh, which I wouldn't like to. Uh, they have the glass half empty, and this is where the rubber hits the road for you, EU member states, uh, is that they have two countries, Albania and uh, North Macedonia, whose accession process uh, is very advanced uh, and uh, where uh, the EU uh, needs to also uh, respond if he wants to keep the credibility of the enlargement process. So to me, this is a credibility issue, and it's not a credibility that will materialize in 20 years uh, when uh, we have to uh, decide uh, more concretely on Ukraine or Moldova or maybe on Georgia. It's a credibility issue that we have uh, with us uh, today and uh, which, depending on the response that we give, will create the space for others uh, to uh, be more present in the EU borders or not. And that is today a key geopolitical consideration that I guess weighs heavily also. Uh, I would say that rather than uh, the, that making the process less uh, reversible, as you mentioned, I would say less uh, teleological. Uh, I don't think the uh, Ukrainian uh, offer to Ukraine can uh, really get off the table. Uh? and uh, that they can have instead some kind of formal uh, membership minus offer or something like that. I think it's a more tangible possibility is would ha to have uh, uh, to assist to an integration process that uh, step by step uh, progressively lose connection with concrete accession uh, to the EU. And so that we assist to enlargement process that become uh, more and more open-ended and, uh, and conducted on pragmatic ways. 
So I think the question would be which would which are the strategic implication of a such uh, enlargement process that uh, uh, that uh, that is only loosely connected with uh, with full membership of the European Union. And I think uh, uh, if we look at what has happened during this uh, research, uh, recent year, we could imagine an enlargement uh, process that developed uh, quite different from what we read in a, in a, a book on uh, European integration for at least three different reasons. First, this type uh, uh, of integration will not uh, uh, take place mainly through law. So the uh, alignment to use uh, a key will proceed uh, extremely slowly and maybe not fully implemented, but will be dominated by form of policy coordination on an increasing number of fundamental issue of uh, key policy importance. Secondly, uh, it will lose uh, its theological focus toward the session. So it will be less focused on immediate fulfillment of the Copenhagen criteria, but maybe we will be uh, primary guided by a pragmatic spirit uh, and the need uh, to, to find concrete policy solution to a number of issues. So the scope of enlargement policy will uh, improve and, and enlarge. Third, this coordination will take place above all uh, on uh, areas where new crises uh, will be, be faced in Europe. So not necessarily uh, related with the uh, traditional area of EU integration, but could be security, uh, use of force, finance. I mean, the traditional core state power that has been so uh, at the center of the crisis of these years. So I think uh, uh, in front of uh, such possible uh, enlargement policy that de develop in this way, I think uh, uh, the just strategic implication could be quite mixed. First of all, we should assure that this kind of enlargement policy framework does not de destabilize the candidate country as <laughs> it can open, often happen. And uh, uh, secondly, maybe that it uh, uh, still uh, capable to have some leverage to exert some the transformative power, and third, maybe eventually to, 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 to lead to a session. I think for to do this, uh, there are three particular things we should pay attention uh, in particular. Uh, first of all, uh, we should uh, be sure to find a way to, uh, that enough money are provided to candidate country to trigger convergence and reconstruction. So imagine some form of more differentiated user that is able to uh, use its own resources even if a country is not full member. Second, crucial will be to keep citizen on board. Otherwise, transformative power does not work only with elites. We have seen clearly it on the Western Balkans, but so some kind of form of more structured institutional participation, maybe I think could be imagined as a part of the enlargement policy. Third, crucial will be to keep the member state in line. We have seen how this kind of enlargement that uh, uh, has more and more scope can be used and abused by the member state for their bilateral issue. And this is uh, absolutely problematic and we cannot uh, allow this to happen uh, with, with Ukraine, especially. Yeah, first on reversibility, I mean, if uh, Turkey is still a candidate country now, which, which it is officially. I mean, that says anything or everything about reversibility. Um, and my, my second point is, um, uh, I mean, I said before that uh, for the moment, um, it's mainly a, a symbolic gesture of the European Union, but I think it has, it has real consequences, real institutional consequences to be uh, named officially a candidate for membership, because then I say a, a very different institutional process kicks in from this, from this very moment. This will not play out now, and I think it doesn't help you, uh, Crane, at this point. It's, uh, there, there are uh, much more, um, uh, there are many other things that Ukraine now needs more than uh, uh, being uh, named a candidate, but in the longer term, um, I think it, it makes a major difference because it puts uh, the country and uh, um, also the other countries of the association trio uh, 
on a on a very different institutional track from uh, where they have been so far, with uh, new mechanisms, new instruments um, coming in, and uh, also I think a new commitment by the European Union that uh, uh, it it, it uh, will find hard uh, to back um, um, out of. But uh, I would uh, also like Matteo uh, see it rather as an opportunity uh, than a tele teleology yeah, leading to some uh, um, uh, outcome um, uh, with um, any kind of necessity. I mean, we have, we have seen that uh, countries have made out of this uh, candidate start, status uh, uh, very, very different things. Yeah? So it's, it's a, I mean, it's, a, it's basically an um, invitation by the, by the European Union, but then it really depends on the candidate countries what they um, uh, make um, out of it. Um, the other thing is uh, that uh, when uh, countries are on this um, uh, pre-accession uh, Track. I, I, I still think this is when uh, the European Union uh, has uh, the highest probability of having a, an impact uh, on these countries. The um, combination of a credible membership prospect, uh, the uh, big incentive or the biggest incentive still that the EU has on, has on offer, um, uh, I think, uh, um, only works uh, if you are a, a candidate country for uh, membership. Conditionality, I mean, we have uh, lots of evidence uh, showing that only works in combination uh, with uh, a, a credible membership perspective. Um, again, it's, it's, it's not a sufficient condition for success, but I, I, would, I would still claim it's a necessary condition if the EU wants to have a sustainable impact on um, uh, third uh, countries. Um, so I think uh, for that reason, um, uh, in the longer term, this um, granting of a candidacy status uh, uh, will be in Influential. I also don't see that there's much room for other solutions at this point. I mean, even with the association treaty, uh, uh, the country um, has a has a, a very high level of uh, European integration at this point, and there's not much room for for other solutions bet between what's had, what, what has been achieved through association and membership. Yeah, and 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 even now that uh, the EU has gone uh, quite far beyond uh, the association treaty yeah, in um, um, uh, making a lot of concessions to Ukraine beyond what it uh, needs to do under, under the association treaty. I think, um, I think we've basically run out of, out of alternative options. Yeah? There's, there's, besides, uh, say, uh, putting the country on a pre-accession trajectory to membership, I don't really see uh, uh, any uh, uh, possible or promising alternative solutions. One interesting implicit or, well, uh, assumption here is, of, of course, the status of membership. I think that is very interesting because if you think about the European Union more like what Schmitter was referring to as a condominium, sort of a collection of, or combination of function and territory, then membership wouldn't have the same status. I think this subtext here is the fact that membership has a very significant implication and also in normative terms that it is a type of obligation. And, and to me, Brexit was important in that sense because it underlined to the European Union that membership matters. And that the European Union has, and I think it has firmed up its conditions and thinking about external relations. We saw that in relation to Switzerland. I, um, and I, it actually also has an, a bearing on how we think about conditionality. I'm arguing that the European Economic Area Agreement is a case of political conditionality. Not necessarily so much from the EU side, but certainly from the receiving side, that, that the states that don't want to rock the boat and alter rules and so on, because they are so afraid of things unraveling. Schengen has a guillotine clause, you know, um, so in formal terms that but I think that logic actually permeates these types of relations. So there is this type of awareness that you can lose something too, 
in the states. Of course, I'm not talking about states that have a different type of affiliation. Um, but it's um, Ukraine is um, has has brought in the geostrategic and a very different set of, of considerations, of course, that 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 have changed this. But I still think that there might be some mileage to the, the distinction between external differentiation and external differentiated integration. I really think we should work more on this because the type of reciprocity you have and the EU's sort of inclusiveness in, in the EA case is, in an, it is a form of integration. So I'm just wondering how flexible the EU might be on that particular account. Um, it, it provides you with full access and claims against the other members and also some type of sensitivity, uh, even if you're not part of the formal institutions. So it's showing some element of EU um, inclusiveness there that, that is beyond a simple norm import on the part of the non-members. So how far can that be, be, be pushed in this kind of circumstance? Of course, this applies to states that already qualify as members. So that's why this is easier for the EU to deal with. But I'm wondering if the circumstance might be somewhat different. So this is just sort of a, an idea that I'm just putting on a the table. There were two other questions, and I think I'll lump them together because to some extent they are related and you have also to some extent touched on them. So the, the third question was, what is the role and status of the countries in the Western Balkans? Of course, I heard that they are concerned that they are being left aside on this even if they have obtained status and so on. And the last thing that is also to some extent related to this is what do you make of the European political community initiative? One aspect is the relationship to EU enlargement, which it is said to be unrelated to. Another is the issue of our policy coordination. A third is whether it works in favor of or against the development towards Can Europa, sort of a, a really differentiated Europe. But I'm just asking you now maybe to think about these things in, in connection. Um, because we are mainly focusing on, on enlargement. So, Arantxa, you please. So, let me uh, focus on the European political community, which, um, in my view, serves different purposes. Um, it serves the purpose of uh, giving uh, uh, a picture of a more united uh, European continent at the time when we've got... Uh, um, Russia that originally would have been uh, perhaps uh, part of this uh, configuration, or at least some would have seen this, uh, but that right now uh, is clearly not there. So it's in a way, a way to redraw the geopolitical map of Europe. Um, but it also has other purposes. It has a purpose of maybe hooking the EU back into Europe, not into the EU, into Europe in a more forward-looking manner. Uh, so not mulling over, uh, uh, you know, uh, how it disentangles itself uh, from the uh, um, EU, but rather how it can work uh, with the EU and with other players uh, in a much more cooperative manner, uh, in a more geopolitical moment uh, for Europe. It also serves the purpose of uh, maybe uh, uh, putting uh, Turkey uh, a little bit uh, closer uh, to Europe under a closer uh, European umbrella, uh, as we have discovered uh, how important uh, uh, Turkey can be from the geopolitical point of view, how much, uh, how difficult it can also be uh, from the geopolitical uh, view, uh, and maybe uh, keeping uh, the hope uh, that uh, the relationship can be closer in the future. It also helps uh, to um, create a space uh, for uh, multilateral dialogue among uh, European Union uh, member states with accession countries, which generally are on a one-to-one, -one, EU to each one of the candidate countries. But here, all of a sudden, you start discussing uh, uh, creating a more multilateral fora where uh, you can discuss concretely uh, on issues that matter to them all, uh, to the EU as well as to others. So it has multiple purposes. Now, of course, uh, all of this is a pie in the sky uh, unless and until the next session of the European political community 
bridges uh, from a picture, a photo opportunity that I must say was a powerful photo opportunity, um, as well as the little photos that were within this photo, uh, the uh, Azerbaijan-Armenia little photo or the Serbia-Kosovo little photo. Um, but all of these would be uh, would face the test of reality in Moldova, uh, and the test is whether or not we can move from uh, all these multiple purposes into concrete, uh, concretely articulating this uh, over a set of priorities. The priorities are the result of the dialogue they had in the first uh, uh, meeting, uh, and now the test is whether or not the second survives. Uh, the first one did float. The second, the question now. Uh, is whether uh, the second one survives the European political community with a meaningful context content. Well, uh, I will go back to the Western Balkan then, um, and uh, I think uh, we should for for them. I mean, I mean, uh, I think uh, it's a bit twofold. Uh, on the one hand, they really sh show us. Uh, 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 how in today in Europe there are no alternative to Euro European integration. I mean, despite uh, all things went wrong <laughs> with their accession process, uh, despite all difficulties also in the Council uh, of the European Union to have a coherent uh, strategy, uh, this kind of uh, integration somehow had to proceed in one way or another to, to give really response to simple uh, issue that uh, that needed coordination with uh, with their neighborhood and so i think this is uh, an important message that we, we should keep in mind on the other hand however it they also show how uh, uh, a bad policy or implementation bad implementation of a good policy can enormously rise the cost <laughs> of uh, of even simple things and uh, uh, the, the small uh, shrinking uh, uh, Western Balkans, uh, I mean, uh, that, that have become a geopolitical puzzle, I think really uh, close, uh, show this well. And we sh they really show how uh, at least uh, our policy has been uh, inefficient, I mean, uh, 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 somehow unaccountable and uh, uh, illegitimate. Inefficient because we have really uh, put the country in the region on, uh, on uh, we didn't uh, uh, stir economic convergence with the country of the region, despite all our enlargement policy. And uh, I mean, it just simple. Just look at the at the budget of the European Union. Uh, Croatia takes ten times more than uh, its neighborhood country in uh, in the uh, session. Secondly, it fostered the, the executive in this enlargement country. In, uh, against all uh, other actors uh, in their society. And third, as I was saying before, it put them in a really an equal fit uh, uh, towards all other neighborhoods uh, uh, that are in the EU. And this, of course, has created both economic and political divergence of the region in comparison with the rest of Europe. And uh, if we go back to the European community, uh, political community project, uh, project initiative, I mean, I think it's still quite unclear what it will be about. There have been circulating two uh, opposite view. Uh, the one we, ha we heard first before with, uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Alex Tab of a community, uh, the, the closest circle of a multi-layer Europe, of a Europe closest ally. So uh, the, basically the accession uh, country, institutionally linked with the EU, and uh, with great resources. But however, it didn't seem uh, the initiative going that direction, if we look uh, at least at the first meeting they had in Prague. It seems a very, very uh, more loosely uh, format of, uh, 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 that has still the, the other advantage of being inclusive, to, to be uh, able to deal with different scope and so on. So I think if I have to guess, we will see some kind of compromise ab among these two vision. And maybe, all, again, uh, we can find an example on this on the Berlin process for the Western Balkan. I mean, in informal intergovernmental format that was able still to, uh, to mobi mobilize internal resource of the European Union, internal structure, and somehow to give a political steer of, of the process. I would, uh, I, I would, uh, if I had to guess, I would, uh, I would uh, expect something going in that direction. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, with regard to the Western Balkans, I think that the, the, the fear in, in the region that they would be sidelined by the Ukraine war, that is, that is mistaken. I think uh, actually the Western Balkans have, um, um, I mean, with regard to the EU's political commitment to enlargement, they have, they have benefited yeah, from this wake up call and uh, of the Russian invasion and also of the, say, the geopoliticization of the enlargement process. And uh, some um, uh, countries have made important steps in the formal accession uh, uh, process in the region, which uh, would not have been uh, uh, possible, or at least not possible now uh, uh, without the war. Um, I think the other point we should make is that uh, the countries of the Western Balkans should also serve as a, as a, as a warning to the EU of what, what can happen, yeah? even if countries have a firm membership pers perspective and if they have uh, 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 even, even, even more than candidate status have, have started session negotiations. And um, I think that we can say that the EU has indeed helped to pr produce and preserve uh, stability in the uh, region, but that has also made the European Union quite complacent for a, for a long time, and it has been fully compatible with stagnation or even uh, uh, democratic backsliding uh, in political and um, uh, judicial reform. So, and I, I think we need to be aware that something like that is also a possibility for what might happen with the with the new candidates uh, once um, uh, the, the fighting is over. Now, uh, with, with regard to the European political community, maybe uh, three brief remarks. Uh, first, it's an, it's an interesting semantic shift if you remember that uh, in the 1950s, there was a draft treaty on the European political community, which looked very different yeah, from what this is now. And for a long time, still in the 1990s, political was basically a synonym, uh, a, a, a synonym of federal. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, with this development, we, uh, we uh, see, I mean, how, how uh, far the European Union uh, has, been, has been moving yeah, in uh, terms of understanding what political means in the, in the uh, um, integration process. Uh, second point here, here, I want to echo actually what uh, uh, John, John Eric said. I mean, the, the, the first reactions uh, to this proposal, to this in initiative, I think have again uh, demonstrated how much membership matters, uh, be be because I think it, 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 uh, the, con the concern of the uh, um, uh, candidate uh, countries was, of course, that this would be seen as an alternative to enlargement, yeah, leaving them in some kind of intergovernmental uh, limbo. And I, I think uh, it was a necessary step to clarify that this would not serve as an, as an alternative to enlargement or even as a stepping stone towards enlargement, uh, that there was a consensus on, on um, uh, letting it happen. On, on the other side, I mean, it's likely to remain highly informal. I see it mainly as a as a as a formal as a as a format to speak uh, with those um, with whom the EU is otherwise hardly on speaking terms, and it matters mostly for the UK and for Turkey. I believe we can eat a little bit into the uh, into the uh, lunch so that we can, can uh, terminate around ten after one. That leaves us about a good 20 minutes, 23 minutes of questions. And my suggestion is that I could take like three questions and then feed them back to the panelists. So, very good. So, thank you for, for uh, three great rounds of contributions. So I, I have two questions. One relates to obviously the cons there's a deep concern in the EU that following the next the next processes of enlargement, we'd be faced again with the backsliding issues because we're dealing with states that are relatively weak, weak state capacity and weak democratic underpinnings. And I think Poland, but particularly Hungary, I think the, the Hungarian experience has really been a, an enormous wake up call for the system. So a question, how does and we know that conditionality is much stronger on the way in and much more difficult once you 
are a member state and have a seat at the table. So how does the EU strengthen its firewalls against a repeat of the last of, of the last experience? And then my second question is about the non-member states. So we, we've talked a lot about the geopolitical shifts, but of course, those geopolitical shifts affect not just EU member states and prospective member states, but also prospective continuing non-member states. So how does this confront, what, what are the consequences of a larger EU for those who will remain outside? Now, they have, those who will remain outside by and large are uh, rich, so that helps, but they can't escape the geopolitical squeeze either. And if we're arguing, and I, I, and I would argue that membership matters, then the, the, the price of engagement with the EU may well go up for non-member states. So just a, re, a reaction on the, the non-members as well, because obviously they're part of, uh, to use Gorbachev's term, the, the European home. Yeah, thanks for three great sets of presentations. I, I just wanted to bring to, to focus really on, on the, our meaning of differentiation as we think about enlargement. Uh, on the one side, um, so you've all told stories about you know the, the, the wars creating the war creating a huge gravity pull towards the EU, but in differentiated way. And keeping in mind Frank's point yesterday about de differentiation. Um, I wonder to what extent we want to look at the EPC as a kind of new mode of externalizing differentiation for the EU. I mean, we have we all show in our classes, you know, maps of the spaghetti pool, uh, ball of Europe with OSCE, Council of Europe, EU, etc. But now we have EPC, which is much more EU centric in spite of it all than the other European organizations. So, so maybe it would qualify more as a, a, a way of externalizing differentiation. But I also have a parallel question about differentiation between how war creates itself a differentiation be between candidates, because we speak a lot about the effect of war on differentiating or not the EU, and we did with, with energy earlier. But of course, if war has changed Europe in various ways, it has changed Ukraine dramatically. And, and we all know that enlargement, and you said it in various ways, you know, suffers from the, what we can call the incorporation paradox, the fact that it's all about exporting a blueprint. And Johannes reminded us that this is a kind of a strategy of empires and kind of colonial strategy for good and bad reasons. Um, but so it does that, but at the same time, the governance blueprint, but it also wants these countries to learn democracy. Learning democracy is doing it yourself in your own ways with your own political and social and civil society. Now, we, there was always this tension. We've always analyzed it and critiqued it. But now we're dealing with a country that has showed us the way in, you know, the ultimate existential autonomy of a country. A country that becomes our, you know, symbolic leader. We've talked a lot about symbolism. So how easy will it be to apply the enlargement playbook, which will be very necessary, nepotism and all the rest of it hasn't left Ukraine, of course, you know, materially. But symbolically, how do you do the, the unilateral enlargement? We know enlargement is not a negotiation, it's an imposition. Um, how do you do this with a, a post-war Ukraine or a Ukraine that is still half at war? So um, I want to go back to this point about um, the, that candidate states are on an institutional track without making it clear what is on the, tr on the track towards what. Um, and, and I wonder how do you keep together the, um, this idea of that Frank mentioned, but also Matteo, that it's okay to be loose when it comes to an end goal, while at the same time keeping accession credible, which is a very hard goal. So um, these two don't seem to, to work that well together, particularly because of the lessons learned. 
So on the one hand, we may say that there has been some convergence with the Western Balkans, uh, but when we say that, we really keep our standards very flexible so as not to say low. Um, and that's not just about the external member states, but it's also about in the, the external, sorry, the, the um, um, Europeans who are not in the EU, but also about the Europeans who are in the EU, because just last week, the Commission recommended to lift the cooperation and verification mechanism for Romania because there's no more anti, uh, there are no more corruption issues or uh, rule of law issues. And that does not say that there's been progress in Romania. It just means that the Commission gave up uh, on this mechanism. Um, and it also means that the standards have been set so low by Hungary and Poland that all of a sudden Romania and Croatia are given as examples they are not, which is do not talk about what is happening in these countries that are not stagnating. Stagnation when you are on your track to consolidation just means taking steps back. So um, the situation is actually only rosy if we lower our standards by a lot. And those standards are also going to have to be lowered in this conversation with Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia. So I think that going forward, if we do try to make a reasonable and you know, rational forecast about the future uh, of enlargement and of these countries, we have to realize that the EU has traded a lot of their uh, principles and um, yeah, standards on, on rule of law, and it's, it's, a, it's a very pragmatic thing. So as it moves forward, uh, we can imagine all sorts of outcomes uh, because it's no, longer, um, it's no longer very clear that, um, that, there's, that we are sticking to something that was familiar up until now. So it, there's a lot of uncertainty, but at least we know that the actor is, um, is actually highly pragmatic all of a sudden. Oh, sorry. Um, would you like to start, Arantxa, to respond to these uh, this three sets of questions? So I would say one of the things we have learned uh, from uh, the last accession process is that um, we placed uh, a lot of emphasis into alignment uh, with the acquis communautaire, um, and we didn't place enough emphasis on building a democratic culture. So we worked a lot on um, tools, laws, um, build, build an institution, have rules for this institution, but we did not work enough on building democratic culture. And of course, um, you can have a perfect institution uh, with uh, laws that, uh, that are not followed. Um, that are not respected, uh, which is a bit of what we have seen. And, uh, and obviously that has created a tension, uh, a tension that exists within the EU and of course percolates uh, to the member states, uh, to the candidate countries, because the, the, what we see in the EU is what we fear will happen uh, when others also come into the EU. So. Uh, in a way, uh, uh, it's uh, it's the once bitten, twice shy. Um, I would put it more in terms of uh, where do we find uh, um, a balance, understanding that, um, again, what we have already within the EU is not perfect, uh, but where will we find a balance uh, in the EU and with uh, the candidate countries? and? not all candidate countries are in the same situation, which is also something that makes this conversation um, uh, difficult because there is a differentiation also between uh, uh, among uh, countries that are on their accession uh, uh, process uh, to the EU. With non, um, um, with countries in Europe that do not want to become members of the uh, European Union, I think uh, we had 
two principal problems, uh, in my view. Uh, one is uh, with the UK and with Switzerland, where we had lost the narrative. Uh, they had also lost the they had also lost the narrative. Uh, in the UK, it was all uh, looking at the past, not necessarily uh, looking into what the new relationship with Europe could look like, uh, and basically being incapable of fulfilling any of the promises they had made their voters. And now this is all uh, uh, becoming uh, so clear that maybe uh, the European political community can offer an option, a space to recraft the narrative. Same uh, in Switzerland, where the breakup of the uh, negotiations uh, for uh, the new uh, arrangements also led to a stalemate. Maybe uh, the more geopolitical moment and uh, the European political community uh, can help in, in changing a narrative and therefore uh, getting uh, some sort of functional relationship uh, on the ground. With Turkey, uh, the European political community uh, is a little bit different. It's not a question of narrative. It's a question of uh, creating a space where we find something we can uh, work uh, uh, that is of common interest. Um, again, uh, knowing that uh, uh, dealing with uh, this regime uh, with Erdogan will in any event uh, will be very difficult uh, until uh, they face the next election process. Thank you very much, Matteo. Many questions, but I will try to do my, my best. Uh, first, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, probably the narrative about enlargement was too positive to a certain extent. It was a triumph, uh, and then it got uh, <laughs> completely gloomy at a certain point. Uh, probably the truth is somewhere in between. I mean, it was, a, in my opinion, a tremendously successful policy, but just it was uh, the issue was uh, the, uh, the next step that we're missing. We're missing a, at the technical level. I mean, we saw that the, the commission simply didn't have the, 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 the technical instrument to react. But I think we weren't prepared also and mostly politically. I mean, it was a political ba battle probably that should have been fought within a European People Party. That was not. And it probably had to deal with uh, Merkel era and uh, the fact that she was trying to solve so many <laughs> uh, things uh, at the same time. So uh, I think it's the dark side of that, uh, of, of that story uh, that also somehow facilitated the situation to go completely out of control as is uh, Hungary today. Uh, third, uh, I think also on this, uh, uh, I think the key, of course, is to have some, uh, to be more aware politically, to have some technical uh, uh, instrument, but also to advance with, uh, with the reform of the European Union. I mean, if you have qualified majority voting in what matters, maybe you are less afraid of, uh, of one single country that can blackmail all the others. And so it would be make uh, all this, uh, uh, all the discussion less uh, de detrimental. Regarding the European political community, I mean, I, I, I was expecting a, a big role for the European Commission, but so far we have not seen, I, I don't think they were neither invited at the, at the summit. So we, we see how much it, of course, they need the European Union, but, uh, okay. Uh, but uh, however, I mean, we, we will see. Then how to, to keep, I mean, uh, certainly the, 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 uh, the, the, the enlargement policy has been uh, quite ambivalent and has been trying to do many, many different things. And you can do that with the Western Balkans that are not such a powerful uh, counterpart. And despite uh, that uh, the North Macedonia is uh, in the uh, candidate status for 20 years, you can ask them to modify their name and their constitution. They can ask them to change their history book at school uh, that teach to children. Of course, it's not, uh, it's a, a, a very bad use of an immense power that you have on this society. That of course, I mean, we should not surprise that they do not get uh, ready. And of course, we have been using this power to ask many different things, but I'm not sure we have been so uh, tough in asking for rule of law reform. On the contrary, we choose as our main ally and our main interlocutor, those that are the main driver of uh, non-respect of rule of law in this country. 
I mean, but uh, maybe they were good in uh, providing other things. And uh, I mean, even with uh, Serbia, that uh, probably is the bad the guy of the story, we see how cooperation with them has uh, increased massively. Look at the uh, fiscal policy of Serbia and how they coordinate the, 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 how the way they spend money. And uh, I mean, and, and you see the, the, this on, on real data of the economy. I mean, they have doubled in the 10 year their trade with us. They are, they have been implementing austerity policy, uh, uh, the dictate of the EU, much better than a country like Italy. And again, in external competitivity, and they have been able to trade much better with the, with the rest of the union. And you see this in that. I mean, they were a good scholar in other, uh, in other things, just not in under rule law, but we didn't ask uh, for that. We asked for change history books and to cut pension to better trade with them. Yeah, so on the on the backsliding issue, Bridget, um, I can think of a couple of solutions, but I think none of them are, are good or, or, or feasible if they are good. So uh, first, I mean, of, of course, the EU could uh, uh, strengthen its own internal sanctioning mechanism up to the point where it could actually be able to, ex to exclude a rogue member state. Okay we will not find any consensus that we would need uh, for that kind of fundamental treaty change. Um, second, we could uh, make con uh, uh, conditionality before accession much more rigid. And that also uh, is about Veronica's point, where you rightly point out that uh, we've actually moved the other way uh, in uh, a recent accession negotiations. Now, I mean, there has been a lot of talk yeah, of making conditionality more credible, more rigid, uh, give it more bite, but there is a di dilemma. I mean, we're, we're facing um, candidate countries that uh, have, let's say, uh, uh, weaker democratic transitions, are less consolidated democracies, have a weaker capacity in that respect. At the same time, uh, we're asking more of them that we used to ask of candidate countries that were much better uh, uh, equipped in the past. So um, this, is a, this is a true di dilemma. And uh, if we want to have, let's say, good and um, credible conditionality, it also means uh, that the likelihood of these countries ever joining the European Union will diminish at the same time. And this will create a lot of frustration in the candidate countries uh, that, we, that we have or, or already seen. So again, I don't think um, there's, a, there's a good way out of that. The intermediate solution would be, okay, um, we have say weaker conditionality, we let them in, but on a very differentiated basis. Yeah, so trying to, trying to ring fence uh, the core institutions and core policies of the European Union, so that even new member states uh, that uh, uh, backslide will not affect the working. Yeah. So, for instance, say, okay, uh, yeah, um, we will not give uh, these new member states veto powers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there are creative ways of thinking about it, but it, it would, of course, create second-class membership. Yeah. And uh, so again, not a not a good solution. Yeah. So I, I, I but it also shows that, uh, say, uh, democratic consolidation is such a fundamental prerequisite of European integration that I don't think there are very good in institutional ways around it. And we should also, of course, point out that it's this is not just about uh, new member states. I mean, there is always a likelihood that old member states. I mean look at what's what's going on in the US what has been going on in the in the UK so democratic backsliding I think is is not just um, uh, 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 something that affects uh, the, the new member states uh, briefly on Calypso's point I think uh, uh, the war has an has an important effect on differentiated integration in many ways uh, first as I, as I already said yesterday I think it leads to this external D differentiation. Um, uh, it makes gray zones of integration less viable. Uh, you have to decide you're either with us or, uh, or against us, and that uh, pushes some 
um, Eastern European countries, uh, say, out of any integration with the European Union, uh, Russia, Belarus, that it forces the European Union to, um, say, grant membership perspectives um, to others, the association tree, trio, there's, there's less room left yeah, uh, of ambiguity differentiation there. I mean, and it also means when you have, uh, say, that external de differentiation, um, uh, moving some countries closer towards membership, I think it would also mean once that happens, you will have a lot more internal differentiation uh, uh, again. So we also have to think about, let's say, the interaction of external and internal differentiation in the in, in, in the in the polity building here and uh, something that we already talked about this morning it also shows that um, there's actually another dimension of differentiation that we haven't looked at so uh, closely in our studies which is sectoral differentiation uh, and I think it shows again that there's this kind of division of labor between the European Union and NATO when, it's, um, when it comes to uh, um, uh, security and defense policy. So I, the war has also re reminded us of that and it has, it has, uh, it has not uh, uh, strengthened the uh, capacity of the European Union to um, in, in uh, military and defense policy, but has uh, rather, uh, say, uh, re-emphasized uh, this division of this uh, functional division of labor be between the EU and NATO, uh, which is another dimension of differentiation that I think the war has highlighted. Um, is one minute to fast, but I, and Lorenzo has very kindly given us until quarter past to conclude the session. That gives us eight minutes. I'm stretching it to eight minutes, but we have to keep it to eight minutes. So I have two, two people on the list. Yourself and yourself. Thanks very much. Uh, my question is very simple. What has the war in Ukraine done to the EU's apparatus for enlargement and procedural steps in what that it uses? Um, so if you look at Ukraine before the current war, since 2014, it's been doing enormous changes in the country. Um, but if you look at the European Union's approach to supporting Ukraine, there has been a lot of parallelism, a lot of disorganization so that member states, Germany, Sweden, France, they all do their own thing in Ukraine. The EU does their own thing. Uh, and so in many ways, we expect a lot of rational reform from countries in the neighborhood. But on our own side, they're, they're, this is what we, uh, me and Pernilla Rika had called organized anarchy. I mean, we used that approach. Um, and so what has this done to us now, right? I mean, we have seen that the support group for Ukraine as a new kind of, um, new kind of a structure has, has been set up. That's, that's new. This hasn't been used before. Um, and so has this accelerated? I mean, you guys are studying this. Has this accelerated some kind of new institutional emergence? And is it doing something with us uh, on, on our side? Are we getting our, our house in order? Um, thank you so much, Elena Jankic, Human Center. I think that enlargement is at, at this very moment probably it, the most complex, contested, and divisive issue in the, if you wish, in the European constellation of, of, of policies. It has to deal with security of borders, geopolitics, uh, raises issues as uh, Bridget and Calypso have rightly said of democratic capacity, uh, current and future of both member states and those aspiring to membership. It's a question of economic harmonization, question of uh, constitutional identity, but also of administration uh, and institutions as, as Josef has mentioned. And it, it, it feels like an overload of things that enlargement is related to. So I think perhaps unpacking them in, in a systematic way would, would be interesting. But I wanna go back to the question of credibility that Frank has mm, pointed out and link it to uh, John Eric's point on external differentiated integration and see to what extent one would affect the other. So how would the external differentiated 
integration reflect on the credibility, especially in relation to Ukraine. Uh, if you think about the Western Balkan states, they had received a promise of membership 20 years ago. And obviously the EU has been criticized in the region for prioritizing stability over democratization, integration, et cetera, et cetera, fulfilling, not fulfilling promises. But think about fast forward 20 years. So fast forward to Ukraine, which will be a post-conflict society that will need quite a lot of uh, economic uh, investment to recover a lot of uh, societal reconciliation and institutional adaptation and not to speak about the role of Russia. So if we think about Ukraine in 20 years and the concept of differentiated integration, will it make it Will your proposal be credible enough for the country to keep on track towards you? Thank you. Okay, we do a very quick round of responses. Uh, I'm afraid we may not be able to do full justice to these important questions, but we'll ask the panelists to come up with very brief answers. Arantxa, please. Very briefly, because I need to leave you uh, now, but I would just simply say that um, Part of, uh, part of the credibility, in my view, will have to do with pragmatism and how much uh, we do a much more step-by-step -step, uh, uh, progress uh, on uh, the countries that will be on the enlargement track uh, and uh, reciprocation of this progress uh, on the EU side. Uh, so moving away from an all or nothing, in my view, will be part of the answer uh, to keep uh, uh, credibility uh, and this would be particularly the case concerning Ukraine. John Eric, thank you. And thanks to all the other colleagues. I will disconnect now, uh, but it's been a pleasure uh, being in this conversation. Thank you. And thank you very much for your great contribution. I mean, Many difficult, a very difficult question, but I, I mean, credibility, differentiation, how to, 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 to keep uh, the, in the long run motivated. I think, uh, I mean, it will be fundamental to, 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 to somehow to, 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 to have a, a process that is effective, that show uh, that is able to bring positive change. Switzerland would be immediately <laughs> accepted as a member. Uh, Bosnia, no. And uh, of course, Bosnia will not become like Switzerland, but maybe we can, uh, uh, we can have a policy that even before a session help this transformation. And I think this will be the key. And so in, in doing that differentiation, but also sectoral integration, uh, access to funds, as I was saying before, maybe some kind of institutional participation together with some reform of the European Union inside, could be important, especially if we see this, uh, uh, how did you call it, organized anarchy, it showed that the, there is a demand for something that the uh, current institutional setting is not providing, uh, capable to provide. So there is demand for which there is not offer and the member state somehow in different formal try to provide it. So uh, it makes, I think, it a very stronger argument that we need to better use current instrument that we have for the large one, that there are many and they are like the, I, I was thinking the new methodology. We, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but to use it co co more ambitiously and more, more coherently, especially because Ukraine is not the Western Balkans and we cannot afford to, to be so, so ineffective there as we have been in our uh, soft underbelly that is still surrounded by NATO member, that is surrounded by EU members and so on. I finish here. Yeah, so uh, to Josef, I think you've answered your own question rather well. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, currently I, I don't see that there are, let's say, uh, institutional structural reforms in response to this. This might happen at a point in time when uh, the uh, EU really has to make good on its uh, promise and start accession negotiations or, uh, say, a, a clearer pre-accession phase with you, Ukraine. At, at the moment, it doesn't have to, but um, it, is, it is then that we will, we will see. And yes, I think the credibility issue is key. Yeah. Um, 
we know from from a, from a lot of studies, uh, also ones that I've been been in, been involved, that this is basically the the key uh, currency in the enlargement process. Credibility is tied to membership, so it has to be a credible membership perspective. Credible external differentiation does not really work wonders. Yeah, it, it, I mean, as I, as I said before, uh, it, uh, say a um, credible membership conditionality is not sufficient uh, to uh, to achieve what the EU wants to achieve, um, but I, th I think it comes close to a necessary condition. Thank you very much. I'd like to end with a couple of reflections. One thing is, I think the issue of, for instance, democratic backsliding, if you think about this from a constitutional perspective, since the member states are the constitutional chaperones of the European Union, they are ultimately responsible also for ensuring that there is no democratic backsliding. They cannot actually offload the responsibility to the EU institutions. And I think they have been doing that. I think they have been shirking the responsibility on this and that this should come back to them. Um, I'm sorry to be uh, sitting in a non-member state and this, saying this because I think we all have a collective responsibility, but that's sort of a, a different issue. And when it comes to the broader issue of, of enlargement and external relations, how a political system relates to its surroundings tells us a lot about its own conception and how it actually operates. So borders are, of course, delineating, but they also provide you with a mirror. So, the, so the, how you project yourself to the external world also matters. And of course, that has to do with issues of flexibility, but also of legitimacy. And yeah, so I'll, I'll stop with that. And thank you very much. Um, excellent contributions and uh, enjoy your lunch.